Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be exploring uh, some of the motions that are allowed at the temporomandibular joint. Now, before we get into the information on this slide, which are the movements of this joint, we really need to have an appreciation for the structure of the temporomandibular joint. And then at the end of this video, we'll come back and look at this and hopefully have a slightly better understanding of how the movements occur here. We're going to begin by looking at the external structures of the temporomandibular joint. Now, the temporomandibular joint is an articulation, it's a synovial joint, between the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa. We can get a better look at this actually on another slide. And here is our mandible. Okay. Notice there's a large mandibular notch right here, this depression, so to speak, which actually uh, separates the superior part of the mandible into two projections. The anterior projection right here is the coronoid process, which we recall was the insertion of the temporalis muscle. And then the posterior projection here is the mandibular condyle. And if you look, the mandibular condyle is situated in the mandibular fossa. So recall a fossa is a groove or a shallow basin, you could think of it like that, that houses a condyle or another projection. So mandibular fossa is actually part of the skull, more specifically the temporal bone. And so because it's the mandibular condyle in the temporal bone, that is the mandibular fossa, it's the temporo mandibular joint. And normally we abbreviate this as TMJ. Sometimes TMJ will refer to a condition, a pathology of the joint, but really TMJ is just talking about the joint itself. You'd really need to specify that as a TMJ pathology, not just TMJ. To be rigorous, TMJ just refers to the joint because it's the abbreviation or acronym, I should say, for temporomandibular joint. Okay, so let's get into the external structures here. So it is a synovial joint, so it's going to have a synovial joint capsule. So here is the fibrous capsule of the temporomandibular joint. It has all the features of a synovial joint as well. Bursa, it has synovial fluid, it has a synovial capsule, all that good stuff. Right here we have a lateral ligament. This ligament directly stabilizes the TMJ by connecting uh, this portion here of the zygomatic arch uh, to the posterior aspect of the mandibular uh, condyle right here. So that's the lateral ligament. Notice that it runs adjacent to the joint capsule itself. There's a couple other ligaments here that are going to indirectly stabilize this joint. And the first one over here is the stylomandibular ligament. As the name suggests, it connects the styloid process right here. Uh, to the medial or deep part of the mandible. So notice it's not attaching on the external surface of the mandible, it's on the internal, or we could say it's more medial, or the deep part of the mandible. Okay. The same thing's true of this ligament over here. This is the sphenomandibular ligament. This is connecting the sphenoid bone, which is a little more interior. It's actually deep to both the lateral ligament and the joint capsule connecting the sphenoid bone to the deep or medial part of the mandible. Okay, So these three ligaments are stabilizing the TMJ. Lateral ligaments doing it more directly, and these two, sphenomandibular and stylomandibular ligaments, are doing it indirectly. So these are our superficial TMJ structures, or structures that are associated with it. This bullet point right here, we're going to come back to this in just a minute. But before we do that, let's actually look at another image here. Now this image is reversed, it's flipped. So over here on the right side of the image, it's been flipped. This is actually the anterior side. Over here on the left side of the image, this is posterior. And the actual TMJ, the joint itself, we've taken a sagittal section of it so we can actually see inside the joint itself, inside the joint capsule. So before we go into that, again, this is the anterior projection on the superior surface of the mandible. That makes this the coronoid process. Here's the mandibular notch, which separates the coronoid process anteriorly from the mandibular condyle posteriorly. Now, of course, the mandibular condyle is one surface of the joint. So the mandibular condyle sits in the mandibular fossa, which is up here. So this groove right here, this basin, this is the mandibular fossa, which is part of the temporal bone. Okay. 
Down here is the styloid process. If we kept going inferiorly, we would see the origin of the stylomandibular ligament. And then here, notice uh, posterior uh, to the mandibular condyle, we have the external acoustic meatus, which is really the hole or the canal here. And this structure specifically in the back here, this is actually the tympanic membrane, which of course separates the external ear uh, or outer ear from the middle ear. All right, now let's get into the joint structure itself. Uh, the temporomandibular joint is interesting because it's one of the joints in the body that actually has this articular disc. We've actually seen this before. We've seen it in the sternoclavicular joint, and also there's one in the acromioclavicular joint. Um, and these articular discs, um, in some cases, can transform uh, the movements that are allowed at the joint. And we're going to see that in a minute, that we're going to get some unique or strange movements here. Um, they're not really so much strange, they're just a little more complex than they would appear to be on a surface glance. But the other thing that the articular disc here does structurally is it separates the joint cavity into two separate smaller cavities. So these black areas right here on either side of this gray disc, we have an upper or superior TMJ cavity. And down here we have the inferior or lower TMJ cavity. So instead of having one larger joint cavity or synovial cavity, we have two. And that's only because we have this articular disc that divides it up. Now one other interesting thing that we can't see here, but we'll see it on the next slide, is actually that uh, the lining of each of these bones here that make up the articulation is different. Okay? The mandibular fossa, again part of the temporal bone, is actually lined with normal articular cartilage, which recall is of hyaline cartilage class. In contrast, the mandibular condyle right here is actually lined with fibrocartilage. Um, and fibrocartilage is generally found in areas that are subject to a lot of stress or repetitive movement where you need a lot of protection basically, like in the knee, the meniscus. And this is no exception here. This is fibrocartilage because if you think about it, we're chewing many, many times a day. And chewing is a repetitive movement. Um, I've never counted how many times you chew during a typical meal, but I'm sure you could look up that statistic, and I'm sure it's a pretty high number, consisting, considering that you do it um, every day, multiple times over the course of your entire life, you'd probably want a lot of protection there as well. So the lining of that mandibular condyle is actually fibrocartilage rather than hyaline. The other thing I want to point out here is that we've got a couple muscles here. It's actually one muscle, but two heads that are actually attaching or inserting directly on both the joint capsule of the TMJ and the articular disc. And this muscle is one of the pterygoids, which we're going to go into in much more detail in the next video. This one specifically is the lateral pterygoid. Now the origin right now we really don't care so much about. We can't even see it. But notice that the origin is going to be more anterior, and the muscle fibers are going to project posteriorly to the insertion. Now in general, the lower head of the muscle, lower lateral pterygoid, is going to more or less insert on the joint capsule. Okay? The upper one is going to insert more on the actual articular disc. And so if we use a typical muscle uh, physiology where the insertion is pulled toward the origin, when the lateral pterygoids contract, considering the origin's anterior, and here's the insertion, this articular disc is going to be pulled anteriorly, okay? So will the joint capsule, okay? And by tensing this articular disc, it's going to change the shape of the articular disc, which is going to create um, some very unique, or we could even say some strange movements at the temporomandibular joint. And that brings us to this final slide. We're going to be looking at, again, a few more of the deep features of the temporomandibular joint, but also uh, one of the major movements that occurs there, and that's going to be depression of the mandible. And it's not just a simple uh, translatory movement inferiorly, it's actually going to involve some rotation and also some protrusion. Again, just a very basic review of what we've been talking about. Here's the mandibular condyle right here. This is the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. We can see this articular disc here, and we've got two separate joint cavities, an upper joint cavity and a lower joint cavity that are created by that articular disc. Now when we look at this picture on the right, this is actually showing the movement. So if we want to um, actually depress the mandible, uh, we actually have to have some movement of the lateral pterygoids. Okay? Uh, actually notice that, again, 
the lateral pterygoids are inserting on that joint capsule, and particularly this upper head right here is inserting on the articular disc. So again, following that insertion, pulled toward the origin type of function, uh, when we pull the articular disc, notice it's changed shapes relative to how it was in the neutral state where the jaw was closed. Okay? Uh, it changes shape and that changes some of the functions and movements that we see there. And so in order to have depression of the mandible, uh, gravity is going to assist with that a lot, but you have to have two things. So the first part of the movement is actually going to be rotation. It's actually acting as a hinge. And that is going to produce depression. Um, if you open your mouth, obviously your mandible, at least the chin, is going to visibly drop inferiorly. Initially, that's really just due to this rotation. It's not that the mandibular condyle is moving down. Uh, that would actually dislocate it from the joint. It's really rotating, and that's producing the depression of the mandible initially. But at a certain point, to really get full opening of the jaw, you actually have to protrude the mandible. And so the second part of the movement is really protrusion, um, and both of those are actually going to be facilitated in part by this lateral pterygoid muscle, which we're going to cover in a lot more detail um, in the following video when we talk about both pterygoids. Uh, but when you depress the mandible, even though gravity can assist in that, it's really first a depression that's more of a hinge movement followed by protrusion. So, if you start with your mouth closed, and you just put a couple of fingers so you can feel it, put a couple of fingers on your chin. Start with your mouth closed, and then very, very slowly open your jaw more and more and more. At some point, roughly halfway uh, to the point where your mouth is fully open, you're going to feel a protrusion forward. And that's the point where the hinge movement more or less stops, or it slows down, we could say. And the protrusion takes over to really get that mandible depressed maximally. Okay? Um, one thing you can actually do to inhibit the protrusion is if you actually put the, your tongue to the roof of your mouth and then try and open your jaw, you're not going to get full movement. And part of the reason for that is when you put your tongue against the top of your mouth or the roof of your mouth, um, you're actually, uh, first of all, inhibiting the protrusion, but you're actually going to actually uh, truncate the depression a little bit. You'll get a little bit, but you won't be able to get full mandibular depression when you do that. Okay? So just kind of some interesting things there. And when you do the reverse, elevate your jaw, uh, you would actually retract first, and then you'd rotate in the opposite direction to elevate the mandibular. Okay, and so that's going to lead us back to this slide where we have the major movements associated with the TMJ. Again, we have protrusion. Protrusion is going to be mainly done through the lateral pterygoid muscle, but also assisted with the medial pterygoid, which we have not even talked about yet. So protrusion, anterior translation of the mandible forward. Retraction, posterior translation of the mandible backward. This is going to be facilitated by the posterior temporalis the deep part of the masseter, and then a couple of uh, hyoid muscles that we talked about in another playlist called the genial hyoid and the digastric muscles. Elevation of the mandible, so bringing it up, we're going to have that temporalis, the masseter, and the medial pterygoid. And then with depression of the mandible, um, it's mainly going to be actually due to gravity, but also the digastric geniohyoid and mylohyoid muscles. And not mentioned here is that lateral pterygoid, which does assist in the depression really by changing the shape of this articular disc. Okay? The only other thing I want to cover in this video is a really important point right here, and that's that the TMJ is actually an unusual uh, set of joints. There's a left and right TMJ. They're unusual in the fact that they're bilateral, but they function as one unit. Um, that's very rare. In fact, if you think about your elbows, for example, we have an elbow on each side, right? You can move your left elbow independently of the right. You can move them at the same time. You can move them independently. This is true of pretty much every joint in the body that has a left and a right. However, because of the nature of the jaw, if you move the left TMJ, the right TMJ also has to move in some way. Okay? You cannot have a left TMJ movement without a corresponding movement in the right. For most of these movements, they would be the same on each side. 
you can have different movements on each side if you're actually translating the jaw left and right. We'll talk about that actually in the next video when we discuss the pterygoids. But the point is, you cannot move the left TMJ without another movement in the right side. They all function as one unit. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.